family came into union when I was sort of 15, 16. I built this like image that I was this clean cut kid playing rugby and people wanted to get behind that. Yeah. Meanwhile, I never said I was that. Like I was like, <laughs> I was playing around every weekend. Like I was, me and my mates got up to a lot of mischief. You know, we turned 18. Okay, now you can drink. Now you're a man. It's like, geez, I'm, I'm, I'm a child. I barely, I don't even know how to put a load of washing on. It took me to the age of 22 to learn how to do that. I mean, at the age of 21, probably 22, like I played in the World Cup. I played good rugby. Like I thought I knew the whole game. It was like the greatest distraction I could have because when I didn't have rugby, when I'd have a week off or something, it would just be bender or it'd literally be like, I get so depressed, I wouldn't want to leave the house. That was a, that was definitely one of the rock bottom points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh what a lad well like i promised season five guest list is absolutely stacked with some of the all-time greats and today i'm joined by one of those genuine superstars of our game he debuted as the youngest ever super rugby player at the force at just 17 years old and not long after he was running out for the wallabies having just turned 18 that obviously forced him to grow up in the spotlight which brings its own pressures and challenges and I know I talk about the roller coaster of a rugby player's journey a lot, um, but I don't think there's been many rides quite like this one. He is an absolute lad. It's one of the greats. James O'Connor. Welcome, mate. <laughs> Cheers, mate. It's good to be here. It's a good intro. Jeez, I feel good about myself. <laughs> you should, mate. I, I, <laughs> no. pre- I appreciate you coming on. You've been someone whose name's popped up a lot um, on the podcast, um, and I've sort of skipped past with you a few times throughout my career. Yeah. I, I joined London Irish a couple of years after you, and... You definitely left a reputation as a lad over there. The young boys in particular <laughs> loved you. <laughs> that was an yeah, interesting time in my life. But yeah, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet, mate. And I'm sure we'll get to all that um, as we go through. But episodes like this one, there's so much to get through. Pretty keen to start at the start for you, like um, hear about what yep. your journey was like from the start. Um, what was it like as a young James O'Connor? Yeah, born on the Goldie. Um, first, like... Like people talk about memories when they're like two, three years old. Like my first memories aren't until I was like four or five. I don't know, maybe I was a slower developer, but I remember like my first, uh, yeah, first year or so in Australia, and then most of my childhood memories are in New Zealand. So we moved um, to Tiatatu in Auckland Peninsula, and I um, so I've got yeah. my dad was a minister at the local Baptist church there, um, and I've my mum obviously, and um, she was teaching Sunday school, and then I had my two brothers, and we uh, we were probably terrorizing. <laughs> there was yeah, we did a bit of terrorizing. So I was, yeah, learned how to play footy over there. Um, yeah, credit a lot of that to some of the guys that were in the church who taught me at probably six years old how to unders and overs, draw pass, True. all those double footwork. Like they're all good touch players and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, early childhood was growing up there. Um, Brotherford Primary School went to. Uh, oh, yeah. And I uh, played for the Teatro Roosters uh, rugby league team on the weekends. And then, uh, yeah, for school, played union at school. But, yeah. Um, yeah, early childhood was, uh, yeah, loved it. Was always out exploring. There's always people at our house, obviously, because my dad was a minister. Um, there's always kids around. We're always, always a footy in the hand. Um, yeah. Came back to Australia when I was 11, 12. Uh, back to the Gold Coast, playing uh, rugby league, all sorts of sports. Um, and then, yeah, sort of uh, slowed down a little bit in league. I missed out on one of the Queensland rep teams when I was uh, 15. And then um, my dad always played union, so he's a, he's a Kiwi. Um, both for Manukau, so he was, uh, yeah, so he was just like, look, why don't you give Union a try? Um, you know, you, you played it a bit when you were younger in New Zealand, like I think it would really suit your game. So when I was 15, I tried out for a rep team on the Gold Coast, made South Coast, and then from there I almost pretty much got poached to go up to Brisbane and play for Nudgee College, and then from then, uh, yeah, Union dream began and didn't look back after that. Yeah, mate, it must all happen pretty quick from then because starting at 15 and then obviously debuting Super Rugby at 17, that's a pretty rapid yeah. rise. But you mentioned your brothers there, and I know you're pretty tight with your brothers. Um, yeah. Um, what, what was your guys' relationship like through those times? Well, we were, all, we were best mates from the beginning, but there was a lot of fighting going on because I'm the middle child, so I was always trying to get to the top top dog spot my older brother is very very athletic and quick so it was great and he taught me like he taught me a lot taught me how to play the game whenever i needed uh to learn something i'd go to him and whenever i needed to practice i'd go to my younger brother and make him run <laughs> straight at me and <laughs> practice my footwork on him but yeah like we we're all even to this day you know we're all we're still best mates and we just actually just did a trip a uh, little road trips in new zealand started um in queenstown wanaka then headed up to 
Picton, across the North Island, um, stayed uh, and visited family on the way up to Auckland and then stayed with my nana for the last couple of days. So, yeah, it was a great, great childhood with them. A lot of laughs, a lot, very active, always competing, whether it was on Game Boy or whether it was, you know, wrestling in the, in the living room or <laughs> WWF style. <laughs> Yeah, very a lot of fond memories. Yeah, and so you said you um, got poached by what school was it? Was it St Joseph's? Yeah, St Joseph's Nudgee College. So it was, um, yeah, it happened pretty quickly. So I played in like a rep tournament, and then um, yeah, I think one of well, Paul Carroza actually was the first guy to see me. So he's still at the Reds. He's been you know Wallaby winger, a great. He would actually, um, so yeah, long story short, said he was the first one who saw something in me and straight away connected me to Matt Miller um, up at uh, up at Nudgee and that sort of happened really quickly. I was sort of spinning my wheels on the Gold Coast a bit as well. I was a little bit, um, just a little bit bored. And then funnily enough, I was actually reading Harry Potter at the time <laughs> <laughs> and the whole boarding school concept, like I was got a bit of a nerd in me. So I was like, this whole concept of going up to boarding school. Like I went up yeah. there my first day and there was about a hundred kids playing touch footy on the oval. One of the guys grabbed me. He's like, Hey, let, let your, you know, mum have a little chat to them. Come play with us. So I was playing footy with them, yeah. hung with the boys. They took me to the gym straight after. And I was just uh, like, they're like, yeah, we used to do some study at night. Then we all come for a gym session. Then we go into the, um, the hall and do one on ones. And I was like, man, this is where, this is where I need to be. Yeah. Got fed five times a day which was the grown boy yeah. <laughs> living the dream oh three three boys were costing my folks a lot with all that extra protein powder and meat and chicken yeah. so um yeah i just went up to nudgy college and thrived up there i loved it some of the best years of my life i truly made so many good friends and it was just an awesome environment not only like for rugby wise but mateship and also study wise like it gave me a great routine into ha- learning how to compartmentalize and really get into a routine, schedule timings in, follow a list, you know, um, to, yeah, really bu- built my discipline. And was being a professional rugby player always your dream? Like, was that always the goal for you? Yeah. I, I remember from, what was it, six or seven years old running in the back in the backyard, I'd shave my head to look like Christian Cullen. Oh, true. You're Cullen, man. <laughs> right. I was like, oh, man, Cullen. Who wasn't man. in that era? He was my favorite. Yeah. Oh, I was obsessed with that guy, but I, didn't ever sh- oh, I never man. shaved my head. I never went that Bro, far. So. I should, I'll send you a photo. <laughs> my brothers found it. They put a photo of me with my shave because I was a skinny little kid and they put, you know, Gollum from Lord of the Rings next to it. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. So were you a Hurricanes <laughs> fan as well? growing up yeah, yeah well to be fair i was a blues fan because oh, yeah. I, I did love spent i did love spencer as well but yeah. any team whenever cullen was playing he was he was the, yeah the team i'm supporting watching them step five guys in a row left foot left foot left yeah, foot yeah square up gas someone he was yeah he was special Mate, he was a freak was, hey. so then your pathway out of school um you obviously must have been super fast so you must have still been at school to be playing um super rugby at 17 were you yeah, so I just finished school. So I was, I was quite young for my year. Yeah. I'm born in July. It's a little bit different in Oz. So, yeah, I finished, literally finished year 12 at 17. Uh, went went to schoolies, flew straight to Perth, and then we're then like, had maybe three weeks there and then got sent to um, Oz 7s. Yeah. Played in the Hong Kong 7s and did really well over there. Then they pulled me back and I played the next week. So. All right. I didn't like, I didn't think I was going to be playing for a couple of years because when I first went over there, the first four weeks, I played wing center pen half i literally played every position every different training session i think they're trying to work me out to be like where is this like we know he plays 10 12 but he's a bit smaller what's he like what position oh he's quick i'll put him on the wing oh wait he likes fullback he's good under the high ball a little bit so i played every position and then um they sort of were like oh, okay like he's not going to play just yet we'll send him to get developed at sevens because that was sort of what you did back in the like back when i first started was if you can mix it one-on-one with the best ball carriers and footwork and speed players in the world and it will develop your game pretty well defensively and also attack and actually did yeah did really well so they after i think one and a half tournaments they got the call to pull me back in to have a have a crack and then unlucky but lucky makiro got injured like the first game i played he he got ruled out so i came straight back in and then played off the bench and then there I was. Did you feel ready? Did you feel ready going into that environment? No, not like uh, that was when yeah, so I played one 
almost like a trial game. It was the first time I played men was probably Jan, like January. And I played, it was just a club, club game of footy. Um, and I didn't make, like I was used to making a couple of line breaks a game and doing really well, but I just couldn't bust the defense. I'd step guys and they'd just get it like a finger on me and oh, yeah. hold on to me. And I was like, I was like, what the, like, what's going on? Like, I, yeah. geez, maybe it's like, how the hell am I going to be able to step up to two levels above if I can't even do what I'm trying to do here? So, um, yeah, just, I think sevens was huge for me. Like it was, it was only probably a month that I did it, mm. but just the training was solid. And I think I just built a little bit of extra strength. And I always had a very big belief that when I'm on the field, like I just go into the zone where like, I just can't be touched. Especially when I was younger, it was more sort of probably not so much fair base, but it was like, when I got that ball, like, run boy like Forrest Gump like <laughs> go son <laughs> and I was just I've seen footage of like when I was younger there's no like method to the madness it's just like someone's here step step oh r- wriggle out of that duck under that yeah and then um which was yeah it was it's beautiful to watch it's just pure instinct but I really had to learn the game and develop the game because I again like I only came into union when I was sort of 15 16 so I didn't quite understand I guess all the moving parts rugby league's a lot more simple I'd, that's the game i'd played sort of all my life i knew how to build momentum i knew how to you know get a repeat set i knew how to cl- close out games yeah. yeah so the learning curve really came probably when i left australia and moved overseas mm. over to the uk where i was like you can't just rely on your attack because you barely get to attack in the back line <laughs> compared to in the sun and oh it's all about outmaneuvering them you're playing yeah. chess now yeah so that was a cool growth period Man, that's crazy how you how ha- quickly it all happened for you. I didn't realize you'd only sort of picked up the game at fifteen, and two years later you're um, playing Super Rugby. And the first memory I have of you was watching the Hurricanes, and I, it might have been your first start yeah. or something. But yeah, um, my first I, bar. Yeah, I remember yeah. it like um, <laughs> go, like you running out and thinking like you're two years younger than me. I was like, man, this guy, how's he out there already at like seventeen? It's such so young, and then to be marking like some legends of the game. And I remember Mark getting you pretty. I might have been quite early in the oh, game. He got me good. good shot, eh? <laughs> no, I was late in the like. So Matt, so I was Matt was playing ten. I was playing twelve. Yeah, and gets kept throwing chat at Mark, being like, he used to do this quite a bit, but he was being like, you can't even get past our young fella because I was just I chopped him like six times in a row, oh, yeah. like not just <laughs> flew up on him, ankle, he's down, yeah. and then I could feel he started getting pissed off, and then we had a play where it was like a double cut got oh. to me, and I went to like I pumped like I pumped back then went to throw the cut, and he just smoked me, <laughs> <laughs> and I think on the I remember watching the replay because all my mates sent it to me, and it's like, oh, welcome to Super Rugby, kid. The commentators are saying all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I was like, which gave me even more of a chip on my shoulder to be like, all right, see, yeah, okay, mate, that's great. You must have been telling Gets to just, <laughs> oh, he did it again in the Brumbies game with um. Tyron Smith and I was like, bro, <laughs> stitching out here. It's probably it's a good one if he makes him pissed off at me, deflects from him, so I have to do all the tackling. <laughs> <laughs> but then obviously coming with, um, I mean, playing Super Rugby at a young age is probably stardom at a young age, and I guess that was something for you to deal with, and probably something you weren't equipped to dealing with at the time. How was that for you? Like the first couple of years were fine. It was just because I built. I was really good at processing sort of thing in the in the moment and almost like reflecting very quickly that I, I, I picked it up. Yeah. I picked it up quite well. It wasn't until I probably a couple of years down the track that I sort of fell more into a bit of trouble. But yeah, the first couple of years I was just wide eyed, just almost absorbing everything, <laughs> experiencing every moment. Yeah. There was no real plan. It was just like, okay, you gotta be here at this time. Cool, I'll turn up. I'm ready. Okay, you got to be here at this time. Cool, turn up, ready. You got to go talk to this person. Cool. Like there was no, I wasn't. It's almost like I wasn't self-aware. I was just this kid walking through life. Like there's no past experiences. There was no like me trying to be a certain way to appease this person or to appease that. Or there was no manipulation or game playing. It was just I was just there in the moment, and that was that was it. it wasn't until sort of. I'd been at the top for a little bit longer. I'd been playing pretty well. I'd played some good super footy. I'd like I'd built this this brand that everyone gives me shit about. I'd built this like uh, almost like this image that I was this clean cut kid playing rugby, and people wanted to get behind that. Yeah. Meanwhile, 
I never said I was that. Like I was like, <laughs> I was playing around every weekend. Like I was me and my mates got up to a lot of mischief. Yeah. And I think that's where I got caught out was that all that word like what I was getting up to and that sort of started coming back and they're like, Hey, this is a misrepresentation of who you actually are and I'm like, Look, I'm just a guy who loves playing rugby and I just want to experience life and if you wanna say I'm like this, like I guess I'll stay I'm that. Like I don't like I don't know any better. Yeah. It's interesting eh, how like you become a role model so young. Um, like you say, you're 17 years old. You're just hanging with your mates who are all having fun. But then, you know, you're good at footy, so now you're this role model and you have to live up to this expectation that um, you've got to be clean cut for the rest of your life. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a 17. Like, I'm 17, 18. Yeah. Like, it, I'm happy to go. They're like your years to experience. Yeah. And that's what I mean. Like, I, and I, because I wasn't quite aware of like the games that people play and how you meant to hold yourself. It was just like, this is just me. Like, if I'm feeling like doing this, I'm going to go do that. I was very still, like, to get to where I was, obviously, I had to be disciplined. So I would get up early, I'd do my training, I'd eat, like, eat well enough, not cleanly, but I thought it was clean back then. Yeah. I'd get the right amount of sleep. I'd watch enough footage. Like, I was doing everything that I thought was what, you know, a, a person does and says, like, an accomplished person who wants to get better would be doing. Mm. It was just some of my habits as well weren't what they would call, you know, beneficial. But for an 18-year-old kid, like, that's how you learn, right? Yeah. It's like a toddler, don't touch the fire or burn it. You, you want to touch it a couple of times just to know, okay, yeah, that's definitely hot. I'll, I agree with you. Yeah. And because between all this, you're, you've made the Wallabies as well, um, 18 years old, end of year to uh, Yeah. Oh, was that ever a decision, by the way? Because obviously you could have played for the All Blacks. I understand you could have played for South Africa as well if you if you chose that that route as yeah. well. Was that ever a decision for you, or did it all sort of happen too quickly for you to even think about it? it well, that's it was happening in the background. See, I hadn't I didn't speak to anyone. My dad had spoken to I can't remember who it was who he spoke to at the ABs and and the the box as well because my grandparents are South African. Yeah, my mum and dad are born and said. Um, but for me, it was always Wallabies. Yeah. Like, like as soon as I started pl- playing like rugby, it was like that's I want to be in that gold jersey. Um, so yeah, that was sort of happening in the background. Like I was aware that it was going on, but again, I was 17, 18. Like I'm a kid. Like I leave that to my parents. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really start. Like it takes you a while to actually learn life as an adult. You know, we turn 18. Okay, now you can drink. Now you're a man. It's like, geez, I'm, I'm. <laughs> I'm a child. I barely, I don't even know how to put a load of washing on. It took me to the age of 22 to learn how to do that. Let alone cook. We'd cook a big bowl of spag bowl. That would last us a week. <laughs> and on top of all this, you're making a, a lot of money, I'm guessing, being a wallaby, playing for the force, being, you know, hot property, having this big brand that you'd built, even though you didn't really want this <laughs> clean cut brand. But um, I, 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 with all that comes money as well, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. It was the better I did, the more I got. And even like yeah. it's crazy to reflect as well, like in those younger years as well, the more I stepped out, the more publicity it was and the more people wanted to get behind me. And I was like, I don't quite understand. Like if the first time like I got like the first time I got in trouble, something was taken away, I reckon I would have learned pretty quick. Okay, you don't do that because that's taken away or okay, you messed up. Now you're not allowed to play this week. Oh, that would have hurt me the most. I remember when I was younger, like if I ever did, supposed to get some, <laughs> me and my brothers, we got us a bit of mischief. So the best thing my dad would do would be like, like, hey, if you don't behave, you're not going to play rugby on the weekend. And then I was like, yeah. okay, I'm going to behave. So it was like almost that's sort of how I learned. But because all these other things kept coming to, to me, I was like, wait, what, what's going on? I guess I can sort of just do whatever I feel like I want to do. That's the mind of a twenty-year-old, and then as you—that's I mean—as you grow and as you get older, you realize, okay, yeah, that's not how the world works. What sort of examples are those? The things that you are well, you're, not like that's me. It wasn't like as in like what was I up to? I was just going out on the weekends. Like it was just more so partying, but I did have like a stroppy side to me where, um, oh, man, I mean, at the age of twenty-one, probably twenty-two, like I'd played in a World Cup, I playing good rugby. Like I thought I knew the whole game. I've said this before, like. I thought I'd, my game was finished. I was like, I can't see a way for me to get better. And I didn't know anything about rugby. Mm-hmm. Like I I knew how to beat defenders one-on-one. I knew how to manipulate a couple of defenders, but I didn't understand like 
what I'm like, what I'm trying to pass to our young tens at the moment, and what I've learned over my journey is like, Dad knows thirty times more than I did. I was just a pure instinct player. Yeah. So that created like an ego where I thought, okay, if I'm I'm here in my rugby and I can't get any better, where am I going to get my pleasure and joy? Like I'm never going to play better than what I've done because people are going to work me out more. I feel like our my club team's not going as well as it was. Like people have left that. Like where am I going to get my pleasure? Where am I going to get almost like you know, my joy because mm. rugby is what always brought the most for me. So that's when I started playing, like playing around off the field a little bit more. I started drinking a bit more. I started pushing the boundaries a bit more and that sort of, but that was the start of like deteriorating like who I was a little bit and then actually realizing I'm actually caught up here and I've done it. Like, like, I don't know who I am. Like, I don't know. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. What am I going to do with my life? It's fascinating. Eh? And at this point, had you already moved to the Rebels? Yeah, that I think that the Rebels, if there's one thing in my whole career that I reflect on that I wish I didn't do was move there. <laughs> not because of the Rebels, like, not because yeah, of that organization, yeah. just because of what what that did to me and what the doors it opened for me. Yeah. And Perth is a very, like, Melbourne, there's a lot going on. I don't know if you've been out of Melbourne and, like, who you can rub shoulders with. And for me, it was, it was a day, yeah, that was, that was a move that really, was dangerous for me. Yeah, well, I could imagine. Like we've had Cipriani on; um, he's spoken about his times there with, I think, what was it, the the Rat Pack or um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and Kirtley and Buddy Franklin yeah, and all that. Yeah. It sounded like you guys had some crew. Yeah, we did. We had so we had a lot of fun, and that crew as well like saved me in a way because I was going through like if I reflect now, I was going through many mental health issues. I had depression, I had anxiety, I had substance abuse, I had so many things going on in my life, but I was still able to show space and like still play footy to a certain degree and still be at least a decent member of society. But I was hurting inside. So it took me to actually leave Australia to actually pull apart everything and just figure out a couple of things out and really get back on track. But yeah, that that was a decision for me that I'm like I wonder what would have happened if I didn't move there and I stayed on the course I was going and yeah, interesting. It's interesting, eh? Like what what was your what was your day like when you say like you're struggling with all that? Um, what was an average day for you like? Well, I think it's funny. Like I've had this chat with quite a few people. So like rugby's so beautiful in the way for me because if I didn't have rugby, I wouldn't have got out of bed. Like if I didn't have rugby keeping me accountable, at least. It, I had to move my body. I didn't want anyone to know I was struggling, so I had to turn up and at least put a smile on my face. So at least, like, your mind's so powerful that you can convince yourself in, like, any moment. You can bring on joy. You can bring on sorrow. Like, underneath it all, there's that – there's was still the heavy feeling. But I'd get around the guys, and it would make me feel a bit happier, and I'd do a gym session, I'd feel a bit better. And it was, like, the greatest distraction I could have because when I didn't have rugby, when I'd have a week off or something, it would just be bender or it would literally be, like – I get so depressed I wouldn't want to leave the house. I'd just literally be in like a dark room at times and I'd sleep all day long too. Sleeping was my like, if I ever start sleeping too much, people are like, okay, so like he's healing, he's going through, like he's healing something. I'm I'm going deep into that, like into that realm where there's something heavy weighing on me and I'm trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. So then you, at some points you have a few incidents in there and you get stood down yeah. from Australian rugby or the Rebels or Sort of yeah. forced your hand to move overseas in the end, don't they? Yeah, they yeah they did. I, reflecting at the time, I thought they were pushing me out the door, but really, yeah, well, really they want they did want to help me at the at the core of it, especially mm-hmm. Ewan, like Ewan McKenzie. He actually, well, a lot of people did, but he forced my hand to be like, look, I need to pull the reins back on you. You need to like, there needs to be like something where you got to prove to me that you actually living this life that you keep saying that you're doing, but I can see you're not actually doing it. Mm. There's got to be, you know, there's got to be a bit of trust that's rebuilt. And so I just took that as like, ah, uh, you know, fuck that. They don't like, all right, I'll leave then. I don't need to be here. Mm. I can go overseas, earn more money. It'll be a new experience. I won't have people on my back watching me all the time. Cause it got to the point where like there was people writing in to our like CEOs and stuff being like, Oh, sorry, Connor at the bar having a wine. I'm like, just having dinner with my missus having a drink like what the hell yeah like and that would get back to me they're like oh mate you were seen here i'm like so i just felt like i just wanted like to explode i was like so i'm trying to be good but 
even when I try to be good, it's seen as bad. Yeah. So why don't I show you how bad I can get? Yeah. And that's probably why the guys at London Irish thought it was funny because <laughs> We, <laughs> yeah, I played up a bit. Well, London's a pretty dangerous place if you've got like a substance, <laughs> substance abuse problem and um, depression and stuff. So, well, there's like it's all based around like Melbourne's a little bit like it's all based around like the scene, like cafes, clubs, dinner places. London, it's like yeah. you can go into that realm, and no one had any like any idea who I was there. No one like cared about an Australian rugby player. They've got movie mm. stars, actors, like they've got the works there so i could literally just be a nobody and i i love the fact that we could just go to so many people that we could just go to different places and it was just yeah i for once in my life i felt like i wasn't being watched like i didn't have eyes in the back of my head when you're in australia was that um always through the media and stuff was it was it that whole thing or was it just um it felt like that i think i attracted it uh well from the position i the knowledge i have now like everything you attract and I was like, so I'd go out sometimes and people would want to fight me or something. And I'm like, I'll go out now. Not, like nothing happens. Like one, because I was this flashy kid probably wearing double denim or something like, <laughs> as well. So people look at that and th- like, they're like, why is he peacock? And so uh, like people don't like, people don't like to see that as well. But yeah, I, I attracted all that. And then, yeah, the stuff like where they smoked this fire, like I felt the media were unfair on me because mm. um, they always portrayed me as this this bad dude. And it wasn't that I I was always wanted to help people. I just wanted to enjoy myself more than I wanted to help people at that point in my life. Yeah. But it was never like I wanted to leverage off this guy to get that or that guy to suffer so I could get ahead. I was never wired that way. Yeah. I've never wanted, I've always wanted the best for people. And if I can't get something over them, then they deserve, like they deserve. The coach doesn't pick me. That's fine. Like he must see something in them. I'm not going to blame them. Mm, it's good stuff. And then you, you've obviously moved. You're at London Irish now. Um, a whole new style of rugby to work out and understand. You know, yeah. On the field would have been completely different, and then off the field, you've got these whole new experiences where you're not being watched, and um, you can yeah. run loose, which is probably quite dangerous. Yeah. Well, I think that was. I was having this chat with um, Lossie the other other day and we are just talking. I remember being on the field looking at both my wingers with Marlon Yard and Taki Thao Lossie. Um, and I was like, bro, it's been 30 minutes. We haven't touched the ball. And he's like, welcome, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we were playing Leicester that day. We didn't touch the ball for 30 minutes. Then we get the ball. We score two tries. Like, great, awesome, like running rugby. And I'm like, or, like nothing from the crowd. Five minutes later, they get a penalty try from pushing the scrum and the crowd's roaring. And I'm like, where am I? I feel like I've gone through the wardrobe. I'm in Narnia. Like, this just wouldn't happen. Like, it's, it was such a, I could turn. And then the next week we played Was and good. <laughs> Andy put on a clinic. It was like shaping straight and torping low to the corner. And I was playing fullback. I was just running all day long. I was like, this sucks. <laughs> but it taught, it taught me a lot because I was like, oh, wow, like there's so many different ways to play rugby. Yeah. And I get why. Because I always, back then, I was always like, how come the Wallabies and All Blacks don't win every game? I look at our, our teams and I'm like, they've got the best running players. They've got the best attacking guys. Like, why don't we win? And then you know, you understand why teams like England and France and who can play very tactically, South Africa, can play a style of rugby that like suits who they are to a T and they can stop us from doing what we do. Yeah. And that was the first time, probably at, well, I would have been 25, I had that aha moment of like, oh, wow, well, there's actually other ways you can play the game. I, I can develop my game more. I could learn how to do this. Yeah. And that was probably, that was one of the fundamental reasons that I started to grow and started to put that, you know, nightlife aside and just started putting more time into my rugby was because I probably got schooled twice and I was like, oh, wow, well, okay, I can actually add add a few the old dog can learn a few new tricks so he's still pretty young at that time but yeah well you said you're 22 and you felt like you knew the, the game you couldn't get better and then you get that moment at 25 i think yeah. every um young 10 at least who goes over to the uk will have some sort of moment like that where they're like wow this is a completely different style to play and i guess that's the cool thing yeah. about the game you watch the world cup and you see all the different styles of rugby that you you can play it and uh, yeah even when you're young, you think you can nail that um, or you've nailed the game or you understand the game really well, but there's just so many different elements that you can learn. So, Oh, I literally look back and I'm like, I actually had 
five percent of the knowledge I have now of rugby. Yeah. Probably not even that. And I thought like that's how that's just the belief I had of myself as well. Like at twenty one was like, oh well. It was almost a sad feeling. I remember we, we got knocked out of the World Cup yeah. in the semi final and it was like this huge high. And I remember just feeling a little bit empty, like, wait, so I've got to wait four more years for an important like like what what's rugby gonna be like for the next four years? Yeah. And I was, I remember being like, like, how am I? Oh wow! Like it was actually quite a depressive moment, in reflecting that. And but then again, that taught me as well to really enjoy the process because when I reflected, even at 22, when I reflected on that World Cup, I was like, what was the best part? And I was like, oh, all through 2010, all preparing, starting to grind for the World Cup. Mm. That whole World Cup process of connecting with the guys, we'd go on little trips, like building that moment. It was the process, not the outcome. That was beautiful, and that. Took me a couple of years to actually digest that fully, but then I put that into playing my life, and that's been a huge, yeah, a huge blessing. Yeah, I love that. that that's so true. And then, so what happened at London Irish? Why did you Why did you leave? Because <laughs> you weren't there for, there for too long, were you? Yeah, so I came like I left Oz after that Lions series when we couldn't come to an agreement. Like I got in trouble at a at an airport um, right. for being intoxicated, um, and then again, like the way the media reported it, like yeah, it was. It was poorly reported. It wasn't. It didn't happen at all. Oh, really? Like what? What was said? No, not at all. What did happen? Well, like, we'll Talk leave. me through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we'll leave that one for another time. <laughs> oh, but I just felt really hard done by, and I was like, I didn't get kicked out of an airport. I literally got moved to a different flight because I had an ulcer. Yeah, it was a, a long story short, and I was just like, I was spinning my wheel, so it was time for me to sort of go and experience something new. But so I, I got to London Irish a little bit late. Yeah. So I was only there for nine months, not the full ten and a half month season or eleven months. Um, but the plan was always to go to France. Oh yeah. And then I really liked Irish, but we just like, it was it was tough because I really liked it. Um, I was enjoying the footy by the end of it, but I was just I wanted to play like Toulon was winning. They were doing you know they were top of the table. Like I wanted to play with like all those players at that time. They had two international teams in their 30-man squad. Yeah, exactly. There was guys who, like when I was there, there was guys who are international rugby players who couldn't even get on the training paddock because there'd be two 15s. There'd be like 10 other guys on the sideline who were international players. It was incredible. That was incredible for my learning. Yeah. Uh, if I could go back now, I would have like, picked guys' brains so much more yeah. in this state. But I still asked. That was one of the big things for my growth period was I just asked a lot of questions of guys like, you know, Gitz, Johnny, Ma. Like Dallin Armitage, Habana, like those sort of guys, I was always picking their brain on different things and how they see the game, and that added, yeah, added a lot to me. Mate, that was a stacked team, mate. Eh? That was unbelievably stacked. We had, yeah, like Michelak as well, Trinduk, Bustero. Yeah. Where were you playing? Lee, Har- Lee Halfpenny. I played 10 to 15, <laughs> 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, well, you mentioned that at the start, like being yeah. that versatile um, player, yeah. being able to play anywhere, force trying to work you out what's your best position. But that's been something sort of throughout your whole career, eh? being mm. able to, I guess, a strength, but also something that, I don't know if it's if, if you felt like it set you back at all, not being able to be one position, but being able to be everywhere. Yeah, it, def- it got me into teams at the start yeah. of my career but then later on it sort of stunted my develop like stunted my development because I never mastered one position mm. I I think part of me really enjoyed moving though because I'd get well there's two things one I would like the new challenge and two I think I was scared of just being one position and then I have no excuse not to fully master it yeah okay you know, it's it's and I always wanted yeah. to play ten, so I was like, if they just stuck me at ten, cool, I'll I'll stick there, because that's where I wanted to play. Yeah. But then I was I was getting moved all the time, and they're like, oh, he's not a ten, he's a fifteen. Oh no, he's not a fifteen, he's a twelve. Oh no, like he's better on the wing. Put him on the wing and let him just roam. So it was sort of like, yeah, it, it's an interesting concept. But I think there was a blend of everything. It wasn't until maybe I got to yeah, like twenty seven, twenty eight. I was like, look, I'm just gonna play center like i just want to play 12 mm. like i'm happy to move to 10 if the 10 gets injured or i'm happy to move to 13 if we need but this is where i want to develop my game at 12 like a bit of every like i find i think for me 12 is a position that's you get to do everything yeah and yet was always your best position in your mind 12 yeah i think 12 mm. i think 12 is my best position although i still love 10 like 10 still the position i love to play probably the most yeah 
because you you get to I, I feel like I get to use my mind more than my body. Yeah. Well, especially now for you, eh? yeah. Now that you probably have a more of an understanding of the game than the young 21, 22 year old. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's yeah. That's the beauty of been in the game for so long is you just you can read momentum and you've seen this pattern happen a thousand times mm -hmm. so before it happens you're like oh, i know what's going to happen they're going to go here let's go here yeah okay now that corner is going to be open yeah so yeah 10 10 12 of uh, my two favorites just depends who's inside me or who's outside yeah well that's true it makes a big difference <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, huge eh? <laughs> And what was your um? What were you like off the field when you're over in France? Did that sort of all settle down, or where where was what was your headspace at? Uh, it was like we had a lot of fun. It was quite like <laughs> you've had a lot of fun throughout your whole career. Yeah, we had a lot. <laughs> we had a lot of. Fun. We had a good crew. Like it was a, like it was an older crew as well. So I came over. I was the youngest in the team yeah, still. Yeah, yeah. So I had guys like like Carl Heyman and Ali Williams and Chris Marsoli like turning up to my and Drew Mitchell turning up to my house being like. Where is he? <laughs> Tell him we come out. So we're taking him out with us today. So like it was like really good fun. We'd we'd go out on boats. We'd go to island hopping. We'd all after training. We'd all like on a Tuesday. We'd all head down to the wharf and have like a long lunch and a couple of rosés. Like it was very. It was. Like, we got up to like a lot of mischief, but it was very different. Like it wasn't the same dark, like energy of me trying to write myself off all the time. Yeah. And because I didn't want to be in this mindset, I didn't want to feel the pain I was feeling. I, did, I just wanted to numb it. I went from that to like France was, I was on the uptrend. I was still, yeah, I still yeah, was not in a in a great place, but it was definitely, I was definitely healing. And yeah, you, there's one night in particular where you obviously get caught. I don't know what it was. It, yeah. with, with drugs or doing drugs, not sure what it was, but you had to spend a few nights in jail, wasn't it? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have been pretty scary. That was a, that was definitely one of the rock bottom points. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was definitely a rock bottom point. It was just a culmination, especially I'd been trying so hard to be good and I had been good for quite a while. And then, yeah, that happens and you're just like, like when, like when am I going to get my break? Why is the university like? Why do I keep attracting this? Like I'm trying so hard. What actually happened? Like where were you? And what was like? What's the moment? Just oh, well, it was all like there was, all of us. We were just out. We we're just at a. We we're in Paris um, at a club, um, and like it's not really my story to share. It's more so Ali's. So I won't give sort of that too much away. But all the the main thing is like like I never got charged with anything. But I was still locked up. Me and Ali were still locked up um, for a couple, yeah, for a couple of days. How scary was that? What's it like in in prison? Yeah, it's, yeah, it was terrible, man. It was like it felt like the best way I can describe it was like it was like a medieval dungeon. Oh, That's what it felt like to me. It was oh, just yeah. wet. It was cold. Just shivering all night. Like like the first night, I we were separated because they, you know, they want to ask for stories and whatnot. So we were separated and guy like smearing shit on the wall and oh. the next night there was just the guy screaming all night oh, like i had ali that night to protect me the big fella <laughs> um out. but yeah it was yeah it was tough jeez yeah yeah it's brutal and could they speak english or like what was the language barrier there yeah it was only yeah, it was only french no one spoke english oh like there was a translator at one stage but yeah it was all it put me off speaking French for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it gave me a lot of trauma. I'd have, yeah, Mate, I'll be yeah. It. So that was definitely, it was definitely a rock bottom. It was, but in saying that again, like it was a great moment for me because it really invigorated that. Hey, if you keep dipping your toe into this world, you're never gonna get to where you want to be. Because I huge, I still had big aspirations. I was still, mm. how old was I? I was still twenty seven, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I would have been still 27. I was like, and now I'm seeing the game. I'm starting to play good footy. I like my training's getting better. I'm not injured. I'd been injured for like, oh, I just kept getting injured. Mm -hmm. So I was building some great momentum. But it was for me, it was just a sign to be like, look, you, you just can't like that can't be part of your world anymore yeah. if you're doing that. How did you get out of that world? I left Toulon to go to sail. Yeah. So I went, um, yeah, I just went somewhere where I was like, yeah, well, I I knew what I knew what Manchester was like, but I knew that that sale would be like this is just rugby for me. Yeah, which it was like that sale became like 
I'm just on the grind. Mm. I lived in Hale, so it's like 40 minutes from Manchester. A little dare sanctuary just up the road from us. It was a yeah, beautiful part of the world, like rolling hills. We had a nice house. Like I had everything set up, so I didn't need to go out. There was a cool little town um, not too far from us, Altrincham, where we'd all go and have coffee and mm. eat out. But for me, it was a very like productive part of my life where I rebuilt, like rebuilt my body, rebuilt my energy, and just like with anything, if you do it enough, it becomes your usual, it becomes your normal. And then you start finding joy in that. You start finding peace in that. And that's what I did at sale. Was it hard to change your ways? Was it? Did it ever feel like an addiction to you, like any of this? Oh, yeah. It was all, it was definitely an addiction. Yeah. It was addiction to pleasure. Yeah. I've had that since I was a kid, though. Just how I got my pleasure in different ways. I got my pleasure from playing footy. I got my pleasure from playing PlayStation. I got my pleasure from being around people. Mm. This thing was, and it's still an addiction to pleasure. It was just how do I define my pleasure? Mm. If I'm injured, I'm frustrated with my rugby. I didn't have the ability to communicate at that stage as well. I didn't know how to communicate my emotions or feelings. And also, like, if I got into an, like, if I wanted to speak rugby with, like, one of the coaches, I'd find that some, a lot of the time I'd get frustrated because I was like, they don't understand what I'm saying. Like, how... Like, how do I verbalize what I'm seeing when I don't have the communication skills to be able to do it? So it's just so frustrating for me. Yeah. Yeah. So then I seek that outside. Yeah. How did you find those pleasures in new things? Like, obviously, if you're not finding pleasure in what you're doing back then, um, what were the new things you're finding pleasure in and how'd you, how'd you manage to do that? Well, I think the funny thing is I wasn't actually getting pleasure in going out anymore, okay. which is why I was drinking so much, et cetera, mm. because I I actually had anxiety in those environments. It's like, if I'm going to be here, like I can't be this version of me. Yeah. I need to be like, like I need to be like going hard. Like I need to be jaded for me to enjoy this. Mm. And I got to bring that energy out as well. Like I was very depleted. Like I didn't have the energy to go out all night. Like I used to be able to do. Yeah. It gets harder. <laughs> yeah. The hangovers get longer, like everything. So like I wasn't finding any joy in it. Yeah. So that was the beautiful thing for me was actually going to a place where there was no expectation for me. I still had mates there who like every now and again would pipe me like, bro, you haven't been out in a month. Like come out, come join us. But nah, mm. like I was just so content and like sleeping, waking up, getting to eat and enjoy food. I got a bit heavy over there because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, because I wasn't hung over or drinking or like on, taking something. Like it was like, when I was bored, I'd eat. I was, <laughs> new pleasure but was, it was food. Very, yeah, my new pleasure was food. Like you see, some, like a lot of people when they get rid of an addiction, like they're an alcoholic, they lose it, or yeah. um, they're addicted to nicotine. When they stop, they start eating sweets or drinking fizzy yeah. drinks, and you see them get a sugar addiction. So it's like you replace one habit with another habit. Yeah, but like. Yeah, so if, <laughs> well, bro, I was, a, I was a big boy at one stage. How heavy did you get? I hit, I hit a dollar on the, I hit a hundred. <laughs> oh, did yeah, skin folds, a yeah, hundred as well. Oh, did you ever hit a hundred? Nah, skinnies? never, I've never been over eighty skinny. Oh, okay. Surprisingly, so still pretty shredded. Just heavy. and it's, I still, I'm nah, but not shredded around the gut. <laughs> <laughs> the guts were probably fifty. <laughs> um, yeah, I hit a hundred. I remember sending my brothers a picture of a hundred, and they were like. Bro, you're not making hundred. <laughs> Send us a photo inside <laughs> centre <laughs> like, now. Now you carry. <laughs> <laughs> now we just roll you up in a ball and roll you through. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. What was I, yeah? What was I saying? So yeah, I just it was just the pleasure came from me waking up in the morning and going and get a coffee, enjoying the coffee, then going for a walk and like mm. not having. It was like a relief that I didn't have to go out anymore. Like it was like I'd broken that identity that like yeah. I was known as the party guy or the guy who would have a good time or he'd always be up for anything. Like, hey, you want to go to the movies? Cool. You want to go out for a meal? Cool. You want to go for a beer? Yeah, cool. Like that was sort of like my identity because I love being around people. What did Save Your World, was that a part of it? Because I remember having Denny Solomona on. Yeah. He spoke about all his addictions and how he was struggling. Yeah. And I think uh, whether he put you in touch with him or you put him in touch with it, I remember yeah. – uh, um, relationship there yeah me like there was a few of us that um started working with um ollie at savior world oh, and yeah. yeah danny was yeah definitely well, he still is my boy at um at sale so there's a there's a couple of us there john and leota aj mcginty ben Curry. so we had a there's a crew of about yeah five of us at um at sale so that helped me a lot because it was like 
we would go do other things that were enriching of our life. Yeah, I was even like that. yeah, go play pool or like just little around go around to one of the boys' houses and watch the footy, but like in like a felt like a safe environment where we could all just. But we're all like on a, a development, like we're all developing. We're all almost like going down that spiritual route where we wanted to see what you know science is talking about the world. What you know. Yeah what this philosopher said about the world are we all learning about ourselves and what connected to us oh does that resonate now that's not for me or oh that's yeah. interesting i wonder why oh let's look into these principles like hermetic print like little things we're sort of all learning together and how deep did you go oh deep when i do something i go all in <laughs> and i thought i knew that's I me mean, for me i needed that i needed to go all in to yeah really just destroy that character i created yeah of myself back in Australia and had jumped in my backpack with me overseas and everywhere. So I went deep into it and it was, it was beautiful. Like I learned, I learned so much about myself and about life and, and then like with everything, like the pendulum swings back down and you rebalance and you're like, okay, like I love this part of it. This part doesn't resonate with me. Um, I'm going to let go of that part. Mm. So it was, yeah, that, that was a big part of my, my rebuild hundred percent. Like I've got credit that, that gave me the energy to actually stick and be disciplined again. Mm, that's cool. And then you returned back to Aussie. Was this all part of it? You're obviously returning as a new man. I mean, you've been yeah. through all of this. You've learned the game. You've sort of found a new a new you. Um, what was yeah. it like returning? It was like part of me never believed that I was going to play for the wallabies again that's where the savior world stuff was so important for me because it was just being fed into me every day like no no like this is on your path like you're going to create this and i was like man they look like i'm 100 kilos i'm I'm like like i'm playing i was back down to about 94 at that stage i was like look i'm playing good rugby but like i don't after everything i've done and all this sort of stuff they don't like they don't they're not going to want to bring me back in i haven't played great footy yeah and then I met up with Czech and we just had a, an open conversation. I think just he saw that I was a man now. Mm. The last conversation I had with him was in 2015 when he didn't pick me for the World Cup squad when I came back for that little stint. And then I'm like, I've got a great relationship with Mark. He's a, he's a good man. And I think he was just like, I do now. And he was like, he just saw something in me. He was like, oh, okay, this guy's willing to die for, for this campaign. Mm. I'll at least put him, I'll give him an opportunity. So I had two days to impress at training. So those two days, I was that guy who was 150%. <laughs> and everyone was like, who's this guy like running around headless? But that was me. I was like, I've got, there's my opportunity. Then Marika Corabetti had his, um, I think was his son. And so he couldn't go to South Africa. So there was a spot there. He's like, oh, can you still play wing? I was like, yeah, yeah, I can still play wing. Oh, come over, come play wing for us. Couldn't play wing. Oh, <laughs> man, I was struggling. <laughs> Coming from the UK, the speed of footy to <laughs> South Africa, altitude, plan on the wing. 100 kgs. <laughs> I, was, I think I got down to about 88 that week. <laughs> so it was like there was, I could feel something was aligning for me, but yeah. there was never like this huge moment where I was like, oh, I've made like, okay, shit, this is happening until I literally just all unfolded in front of me and then I got picked to play against the All Blacks in that Perth match. Yeah. And I just remember it was like, oh, the start, like, wow, I've done, I've done this. I've created this. Like, yeah. all that work and, yeah, it's a, yeah, it was a very proud moment. Oh, yeah. Was that yeah. probably more special than any of the other games, like that feeling? You know, you've obviously had a debut yeah, as a young kid, but that moment when you run back out for, you know, I think a six-year break never quite sure if it was ever going to happen and then yeah. that moment's pretty cool yeah man it was I, I can still feel it now like sitting there like i remember the lead up because again i hadn't played great right i played solid footy I, mm. I was making like 12 14 tackles a game i was getting some good carries like i was i was playing good rugby but not within that that framework that we had at sale at that time as well it was such a team game. You see them even playing now. Like it was such a, a team game. Like mm. not one person was like just pulling the strings, and it was just a solid play at the line, make the right decision. So I was doing that footy, but I came from that three months off. We finished our season, so I hadn't played a game in three months. Got five minutes against Argentina, and then the next week I'm starting against the All Blacks. Yeah. So I was like, well, either 
they're going to see that I'm full of shit or like <laughs> I've done the work and I've actually, I'm, I'm ready for it. I remember reflecting before the game. I went out, went for a walk on my own. I was just sitting, doing a bit of meditation in the sun. And I was like, I told him, I was like, well, universe, I'm here. You put me here. So, but what's going to happen? Like, I'm just going to go out there and just play. So if you want me to keep going on this trajectory, then give me some energy. And then literally the first move of the game, like, I almost drop a ball and it bounces. So I haven't timed it well. I pick it up and just slide through a tackle and then offload and we score a try. I was just a few moments where it was like, I wasn't even like doing it. It was like fluke stuff. Yeah. It's not like stuff where I was playing at the line, like picking this defenders in here and I'm making reads. It was like almost an error turned into a positive, like twice. There was another one where Anton Leonard Brown's like went to hit a ruck and I can see Nick White's about to pick it. So I tackle him it's legal, like not illegal, but it's, yeah frowned upon <laughs> and then he slides straight up the sideline and we score in the far corner because i've like cleaned out their cleaner yeah he was trying to get to his feet like little things like that that just i didn't think it just happened yeah. so yeah that was uh it was and then we we obviously won that game as well yeah so it was, yeah it was a beautiful moment and to do it in perth too it was pretty special right that's so cool in, in your rugby journey like the biggest thing i noticed about you coming back was um, your ability to square up defenders and put other people into space, whereas mm. I felt like before you um, left for the UK, it was it was you stepping, you were, you were taking yeah. everyone or making those breaks for yourself. Awesome for fantasy yeah. rugby, but um, yeah. sometimes niggly for the person <laughs> outside you. <laughs> oh man, a hundred percent. What was it? it was all about me when I was before I left. Mm. It was like, and not in the, like it's not a bad way that it was about me. It was like. Well, I thought I was our best player. Yeah. So I was like, give me the ball. 100%. Let me do something good for our team. Like, do we want to win? Like, give me the ball a bit more. Let me take someone one-on-one because there's more chance that I'm going to go through than, than you are. Mm. But if I get through, I can offload to you. Then you can score. Like, isn't that what we want? Yeah. Or I'd be like, wait, why do you want me to tackle this guy? He's way bigger than me. Why don't you tackle him? And then I can save a bit more energy and then I can set you up next. Like, it was just, that's how it worked in my mind, yeah. which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It was just like, surely we use people for what they're good at. Yeah. But then when I went overseas, I busted my ankle a couple of times. I couldn't step for two years. Couldn't step off my left. True. So it was like, I had to relearn the game. So as much as I wanted to learn the game, I had to learn how to like, okay, how's this guy going the line? Like I watched a lot of other players and how they manipulated. And then I sort of married it into the way I move. And with my long monkey arms and <laughs> the weird body shape that I am, it was just, it it all married in because I put time and effort into it. Yeah. So yeah, I learned I learned the game of rugby, which has been the finest part because I love I love playing more now than I did when I was younger. Mate, that's that's cool. And what about the World Cup? Obviously, you were on the frame for the World Cup. Probably lost a bit of hope once yeah. Eddie. You knew that Eddie was going to go for a sort of young rebuilding type Oz Wallabies side, which was never going to play in your hands. But how hard was that for you? Yeah. Um, I guess to miss out on that World Cup selection. It was tough. It wasn't as tough as I thought because I'd already been dropped the year before yeah and that, that was my own stuff like hey I wasn't up to I couldn't keep up with what they were doing at training for me I was like this is ridiculous like I'm a I'm a rugby player I'm not like I'm here to play well on the weekend like if you're going to train me this way I'm not going to perform and I just wasn't prepared to be able to like I just couldn't physically keep up oh really if I'd maybe worked a bit harder earlier in our, in our super campaign maybe my body would have been a bit more primed but I just felt like emotionally, sometimes people don't take into account, like you finish a season and you're here, you need some time to like just have that buffer before you can build again. Mm -hmm. So I found it really difficult going from like, when I was younger, I was when I was playing with the force, we didn't make finals. So with the Reds, we've been making finals, we've been doing all this. And I've been like so heavily involved in game plan stuff and the political stuff and like energizing the group. Like I've been playing 10. So I, it's asked so much more of me energetically than anywhere else I've played in the world because I've been involved so much part of like the leadership group, the captaincy group. Like I care so much for this team. So when I finished the season, I was like, I didn't have anything else to give. And then I was seeing guys who could just kick up a level. And I'm like, I need like a couple of weeks to be just to die, like decompress yeah. and then let me get my hunger back for it. Mm. And that's reflecting again, like, would I do it differently if I knew that was going to happen? Yeah, I would. I would have found a way to possibly do it differently. But yeah, going on the World Cup stuff. So I was still with the group like the week they left yeah. to France. Like I was up in Darwin training with the group 
um because carter gordon was injured so i was up there um training with them we did all like i did all the Aussie games against tonga against portugal i was in france and england during the world cup playing with the barbarians team so it was 15 aussies and eight japanese guys who were in standby for the world cup so my opportunity did come someone got injured and i was up to go over there but i'd injured my knee oh true yeah crazy and so didn't even yeah. realize it jorgensen left and that day i injured my knee against um scarlets oh niggly and was that playing for the barbarians playing for the barbarians yeah what was that like did that um spark oh, up all... any um old <laughs> old habits <laughs> not not like i just, that was my favorite like, i loved that tour because it was just just rugby like no one was really no one could really like there was people coming to the stadiums to watch us yeah we were playing we had a stack team and like we had a wallaby team and a japanese team like that that team we had for baba could be an international team yeah and there was no like we had freedom to do whatever like they <laughs> they were literally like <laughs> gilly and Gracie were like create some moves play like what do we want to like let's have fun with this so we were scoring yeah. 50 points a game like we were playing all the think of all the moves you've always wanted to try (laughs) we were doing that with like some of the best rugby players in the world so it was silky like watching some of the footage back it was fun rugby or like it was awesome time and the balance as well was great it was like an old school tour where everyone was getting together on a tuesday after training going for dinner having a beer wednesday guys would go explore thursday just a half day and like everyone was playing pool everyone was like just connecting it was it was a very light tour and i think it reflected in the way we played as well Right, there's something in there, eh? Oh, def- but when you're feeling joy, when you're content with your life, when you're fresh, yeah. no one that, like you play so much better. Mm-hmm. Like I've got my philosophies on performance and high performance, strength and conditioning, all the GPS stuff, but like, that's a whole other <laughs> topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you and me both will be here for hours if we get into that. <laughs> <laughs> you have transitioned into coaching, and I think it. Player, official player coach this season with the Reds. First time I've ever um, seen that. No, no, no. You're not. No, I'm not. I'm not. No, no I'm not. I'm not. So I'm, I am doing coaching, but I'm doing coach. So I, I coached Churchy first 15 with uh, Ryan Schultz this year. Um, and I'm going to do a couple coaching like with like this year after Super Rugby. I'll do some stuff with the I was under 20s, the Reds, like the Queens and 18s. Um, I'm going to do some stuff with brothers and school work. But I'm just a yeah, player. And that's oh, how I want to be. Yeah, because I thought I read an article with um, Les Kiss speaking about what happened there. Yeah, oh no, it's got he's all, jumped the gun. I yeah, like that's what I mean. So we were coaching, um, helping coach when our Reds team was playing Panasonic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't actually playing because I had the, the knee injury. Okay. So there was a few guys. Jock Campbell was coaching as well. So it was uh, Fluky, uh, Liam Wright. So there was a couple. Like so, we have done coaching, but I won't be coaching like. Yeah, and an yeah. actual capacity of, of the red. Okay. I was wondering how that was going to work. Team selection, mate. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> some of those, yeah, team selection. So Gitz actually did that when we were at Toulon, and he didn't pick himself for the final. Oh, really? He picked another 10, and we were filthy at him. And he's like, I can't pick myself. I'm coaching. I was like, bro, if I was coaching, I'd put myself in the team every week. <laughs> I'm captain and coach. <laughs> um some of those media articles like were quite confusing. Like even when I was announced that I was staying at the Reds, it was like, yeah, I'm I'm a player. I've signed as a player, but I am doing coaching, and I'm I like part of it is like I wanted to help mentor some of the players coming through, and especially the guys just coming out of school, which I'm already doing. Like I'm, like I said, I was coaching at a school team, but I yeah. like to do a lot of work with some of the young tens coming through Queensland and young fifteens coming through. Do a bit of kicking coaching online. Um, like with them, there's an app sort of that we use. Like there's a couple of things that I've been tinkering as well, but that's sort of outside of, for me, that was more just started as just enjoyment and I wanted to share my knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I've realized as well, the more you teach, the more you actually learn about yourself. Like so many times I've taught a kid coming through a, something I'm like, oh man, you got to stick to this. I'm like, oh wow, that's why I'm pulling the ball left. I haven't been doing that myself. So then it <laughs> yeah. takes you back to the drawing board. Yeah. yeah. Right, it's fascinating. So coaching's definitely something you want to do in the future, but you see yourself playing for a couple more years with the Reds. Yeah. Yeah. That ideally that's the plan. Mate, how good. Would the transition be to coach the Reds? Would that be the ideal transition for you? Well, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, in some capacity. Again, like I've learnt in my journey, like 
it's fun to like it's cool to make plans and to like to bring stuff in and will stuff in but the beauty of it at the moment and where i'm at now is i've almost not reverted but i have this knowledge now but i've come so i'm back the other way where i just like inviting life to surprise me yeah who knows might be over in france might be in japan might be here i might have a complete flip and just want to go exploring for six months of the year yeah. once i finish finish playing footy or yeah like i'm i'm just sort of taking it sort of how it comes like I'm, i've really enjoyed this preseason. the last we our first two days back were thursday friday so that was got steamy it was good back <laughs> with the boys it was uh yeah some some tough footy where we're getting through it and my body feels good my mind's as uh, invigorated as ever so i've got a, i've definitely got a plan ahead for this next year and then we'll we'll go from there after mate how good looking forward to seeing you back out there um another big season for the reds yeah no right. doubt you guys will be somewhere in there come business time of the year but as always i've gone to the instagram for some questions so i've had a few i've had heaps actually pop up pop in for you so i'll try and rattle through a few of these quickly to finish but first question was ask him about the greatest try saving tackle ever on tommy bow 2011 rugby world cup oh how good hey how good what a memory <laughs> he hit the treadmill hard <laughs> i got lucky there um yeah that was that was probably the fondest moment of my life like we lost that game and it was like a last minute one but it was definitely i haven't been known for my defense but whenever that clip comes up that's pretty cool to watch you're resharing <laughs> that all day <laughs> all day i think i've reshared that about 15 times <laughs> Oh, what a clip. Okay, the next one, so you might not be resharing this one, but talk us through your clearance kick against the Sharks. With the Reds. I was literally going to say, I repost that one so much so the <laughs> other one drops down. That was that was the peak of my frustration yeah. at that moment. Like, it was all like, if my life was a kick, it would have been that at that stage. <laughs> like, I'd come back from France. I did my knee, like, the second session, so I was playing without an MCL. Oh, true. I was just... I was struggling. Like I just wasn't. I was missing some sharpness. That play as well. We were going to attack the line to score. They make a break. I chase all the way back from the other side of the field. Make the tackle. They end up losing the ball. We get a ruck. I run back into the end goal to clear it, and then I duff it. And I was like, <laughs> and everyone's like looking at me like, look at this. And I was like, you motherfuckers. I've literally run all the way from here to make a tackle to stop here to get back in here because all you guys are still at the 22 and now I'm copping it. <laughs> oh, that was it. Yeah. Right away. I, had to, I had to look that up because I didn't know, I didn't remember the click, kick at all. But uh... Look at my face, man. You can see I just got hands on head. My face is like white and I'm just like, I was like, I'm like, man, what, like, what am I doing? <laughs> the thing was, the guy who caught it, like, Got crammed. He tore his hammy. <laughs> oh, he pulled his yeah, hammy. he pulled his hammy. He wouldn't have been there if he <laughs> if he hadn't. So, yeah, you're right. Just all the stars aligned. So laughable. Like <laughs> stars aligned. Yeah, literally. So lucky I'd had a few of them. So the comeback, I've had a few on the other side, which has been lucky. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep sharing the Tommy Bow, aren't we? Yeah. Um, okay, next one. How'd you get the nickname Rabbit? That came. When I was five, like the first time I picked up rugby, I couldn't catch or pass, but I would just like zigzag and step people. Yeah. And then didn't have it in New Zealand when I played, but <laughs> came back to Oz and so I was playing the Burley Bears under 11s rugby league and I came back from New Zealand. So they were all calling me Kiwi. Oh, yeah. And my dad was like, your nickname's not Kiwi, it's Rabbit. That's your nickname, <laughs> it's Rabbit. Tell, tell them not to call you Kiwi. <laughs> So that, and then Rabbit just stuck, and I had it all through school. Everyone, like, no one knew me as James, everyone knew me as Rabbit, and it's gone from Rabbit to Rabs. There was a, obviously other stories behind the Rabbit that made it fueled it a bit more. But... Yeah, that's the one <laughs> the I thought it might have been that. off. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> but no, the purity of the story was my footwork. He runs like a rabbit, he's a five year old. Get the Rabbit, smash the little parlangy boy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next one. If you could start your career again, what would be the number one thing you'd do differently? Pure, purely for rugby, I would have just developed in one position. Yeah. And then I would have loved to have been like a one club man. I think there's just such such a beauty to that. And as well, Stan, like if it's just for rugby as well, Stan in Australia. 
But then if I didn't leave, I wouldn't have developed my game. If I didn't play every position, I wouldn't know what my guys outside me want when I'm playing 10 or 12 now. I wouldn't know how to deliver them the ball and also how to hold them accountable because I knew when I was playing, because I've played so many different positions, I know. Yeah, hard one. It is so hard, eh? It's mm. so hard, when you, especially when you look back at moving. Like you look back at your moves, it's hard to – regret any moves because of what you learn whether yeah. the move goes good or bad eh? like that's why um yeah interesting to hear you speak about that being that one club man i there's certain guys who i like who have played for just one team or like they've just played in australia that i'm like like i say to jimmy slip all the time like, i don't know how you've done it like credit to you yeah. like hoops as well like i was like, like it's impressive mm. to be able to like get your mind ready it's the same grind. It's the same group. It's the same coaches. It's just, you know where the highs come in the season. You know where the lows are. You know what the sprints like. For me, the like that is mental resilience. That's turning up. Whereas yeah. for some, for them, they're like, I would have found it hard to go overseas. It's a new game to learn, new environment, new language. I'm like, that was the exciting thing for me was just being able to change. Because again, I know I said earlier. Part of me moving position was because there wasn't as much of accountability to master one position. Same as moving clubs. You play well for two seasons. Oh, how am I going to play well again? I've had those thoughts as well. When we won 2021 with the Reds, I was like, how am I going to top this season and play better footy? But then you got to go back. You got to dig deeper and go back to the drawing board and learn a new skill or a new a way to play the game. So, yeah, so many different ways. So I haven't given you a clear answer on that one at all. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it just goes to show it's it's, it's an impossible mm. question, really, isn't it? Like, um, what would you do differently? What would you change? It's I'm happy to... where I am right now. I'm at peace and hundred percent. So yeah, nothing. The journey you've been on, it's all all part of it. And you've spoken about that a few times already. Like mm. the the whole journey of it is is the coolest part. It's um, yeah, not so much the the final whatever the um, outcome is at the end. It's that that whole process and the journey um, to enjoy while you do it and. The guys yeah. who do that throughout their rugby um, careers always enjoy it a lot more than the yeah. ones who are so focused on those outcomes or um, trophies. And or the, that's the stuff you remember is the process stuff. Yeah. That's the stuff that gets you out of bed. Like the outcome can hold you accountable for a month or two, but you're drawing on something, an illusion that's not actually there that might happen, that might not happen, that so it's not tangible. Mm. Mm. Okay, next question. Did you ever consider playing in New Zealand? Yeah, I did. Uh, Chiefs in 2022, 20, I think it was. Did you? Oh, true. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, it might have been 20. Yeah, what year was it? Maybe 2021. Because um, it was like during the COVID period, mm. they had put all contracts on hold. So I didn't know what was happening. I was trying to negotiate. Um, nothing was coming back. And then, uh, yeah, so I spoke with Dave Rennie and had a little ch- chat to, yeah, Roger Randall and a couple of guys down there. And, we yeah, we got pretty close, uh, popping over for a season. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, then it was, yeah. Sure, that would have been interesting, eh? Yeah, that would, yeah, yeah. It would have been. I would have, I, it was definitely something I was, oh, yeah, it was definitely something I was really excited to, to try because I really wanted to learn like the, the Kiwi style of playing and just how they're reading momentum. Like, I played with a lot of, obviously, Kiwi boys, but I've never um, never been in that system, mm. and it looks like a pretty exciting way to play. Yeah, did, did you ever look at it as a as a young guy instead of going over to the UK? Did you ever think about New Zealand at that uh-huh. point or no? Yeah, I thought about South Africa. Oh yeah, um, at one stage because I love Cape Town so much, and <laughs> the Storm is like they actually put a little offer in for me, so oh, that was right. um, okay. that would have been cool. Uh, but the closest I got was probably to the Melbourne Storm. Oh, in yeah. league. I was going to ask that. Yeah. There's another question that popped up. Did you ever consider the NRL? So the Storm was a genuine option. Yeah, it was. So when I left, I was in 2013, I was 50 50 sort of sitting with going to Irish or going to the Storm oh, far out. for a couple of years. Yeah. Mate, that would have been fascinating. Oh, man. Would have been. Well, they still had the. There was a spot opened, opened up at six. Can't remember who left, but they still had Conker Smith Slate. Crazy. Mate, that would have been unreal, eh? Yeah. Do you look back on that and think, what if? Or that was that's probably one of the one ifs I would have because that's I mean I I grew up playing yeah. league from five years old to fifteen. League was my was my main game. Yeah, I go 
when I came back to Oz, played at Burley, played for all the Queensland rep teams in South Coast from under 11s to yeah, 15s. That was uh that was my game, yeah. Mm. So I would have, and obviously I love or like everyone loves Origin. Yeah, man, that would have been all. And guys who I played with coming through, like there's, I think our under 12 team, there was eight guys who played, like went on to play for the Kangaroos and. Oh, far out. So I know a lot of the a lot of the guys, yeah, who were playing. Of like I played with two juniors. True. Yeah. Would you ever do it now, or do you feel like it might be too late? Nah, it's too late. If, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna make that transition, especially in a ball playing role, mm. like if I was a big center or a winger or like I still had the same foot speed at fullback, it would be very different. Yeah. But I think if I'd be move like I'd be moving, yeah, to probably play six. Mm. It you'd you'd really need to learn the game. It take probably a good two years mm. to get two or three years. Well, you've seen guys who have swapped over. Some have done it really easily and made the transition, but I feel like they're more of the just the athlete athletes, guys who are actually just ball ballers, ball players or yeah. in the system takes them a little bit longer. Mm. Mate, that would have been crazy seeing you at the storm for um, the glory yeah. days back in the day. Yeah, yeah, would have been, bro, glory <laughs> days. Okay, next one. Hardest man to tackle in your career? Someone's put Rennie Ranger, question mark, question Whoa. mark. He, Rene got me good. He got me good twice, actually. He's a hard man to tackle, got, eh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. He just throws himself into it. But he won. There's a highlight. You think my one's bad. There's a highlight of Rene bumping me, like, I fly about, like, five meters. The worst <laughs> thing of that one is, like, uh, I'd just done my SD. <laughs> I'm, I'd, be, I'd been on the trial. I'd just scored a try. So I'm on the trial line getting seen by the doc, like, deciding if I'm going to come off. She gives me a couple of Panadol. So run back in to join the line. He makes a break off kickoff and has 40 meters to run at me. So I'm like trying to move him onto the other shoulder so I can chop him. Then he goes straight into me. <laughs> that one hurt too. It's not often like, you don't, I don't know if, how you feel, but yeah. things don't really hurt on the rugby field. It's more like you tweak your knee or something. Yeah. And that bump hurt. Yeah. That was like a bang head back on the ground. The ones that look yeah. sore don't often. Aren't often yeah, the, the ones, ones that, that look sore aren't. Yeah. 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 Um, but they're probably the hardest man to tackle is Tui Sava. Oh, true. Josh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he'll bump you, he'll palm you, he'll step you, he'll goose step you, and then he'll run back around for fun just to bump you again. <laughs> like, he's he's granite. He's one-on-one. Like, I'm impressed with any of like, you. You know how there's those one-on-one comps now? You yeah. put him in a one-on-one comp, no one's tackling him one-on-one. When's that? Because yeah. he's got long arms too. He keeps you away. He's quick. He runs 10 metres a second. To a silver. Yeah, he looks He looks absolute nightmare. Okay, like next granite. one. Hardest place to play? Well, the only place I haven't won at is Eden Park. So True, Eden Park. Yeah. yeah. Have you never won there in any? I've never won there, yeah. Country or club or anything far out. That's a stat. I thought I remember watching the um, Fiji um, Drua versus the Reds game pretty closely last year because we were playing whoever was in the quarter final, whoever won that one, and that looked that looked like a tough place. Oh, they, that looked like a tough place to play. <laughs> our game plan fully backfired. <laughs> we're like, okay, it's going to be wet. We're just going to maul them. Box kick. They're going to hate it. They were catching one hand and the like, I've never seen anything like and like they're not known to be a great mall team, but they were just everything that could go wrong for us did and, and they were just a different beast. Yeah. I remember like, I'm friends with Frankie, they're nine. Oh yeah, yeah. And he was flying at my legs a couple of times. It's like, bro, you're like, like hard, eh? careful of the knee like careful of the knees. Yeah. Like, not yeah. today, brother. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was yeah. Well, I've only played over there once, so that, I've actually, to be fair, I've had a few thrashings at Eden as well. So yeah. I'll put it that one. Nah, fair enough. Okay, last question. Best piece of advice you have for a water lad listener? Always finish the podcast with this one. For a water lad listener? The only, yeah, not much has come of it. So the only thing that's come for me is just authenticity. Mm. I'm like, now, when you're younger, you want to fit in. You want to just go with the crowd. You want to just be one of the one of the herd. I think I was having this chat with one of the boys the other day. I'm like, 
I think the beauty of when you, as you grow up, you really love people who are just purely authentic, who have their little odd quirks that are just themselves. I think that gets you the furthest in life instead of trying to play the game and not manipulate, but leverage and this and that. The more you're just in yourself, your truest version of yourself in every moment and just taking it in, the more you'll enjoy life and the less you'll have uh, to regret. It's so true. I love it. And how how do you do that? How do you do that earlier? Or how do you become more comfortable as a as a young fella, do you reckon, to be able to own who you are? Because I, I guess probably yeah. a lot of people know it, but they think, how the heck can I go into an environment, a rugby environment, and just be this weirdo who I, who I am at home? Oh, yeah, bro, 100%. <laughs> well, for me, it's time on my own. That's how I learned. Yeah. Because when I was young, I was always around people. I was always busying myself with either the pleasure stuff or – playing something or chatting to this person or trying to set that up or this up or the more you can actually just spend even if it's like half an hour or even 10 minutes at home sitting on your own bored like Mm. we're not bored anymore we're never bored and boredom brings creativity it brings learning of yourself and hey why am i feeling this way what am i like what do i actually like who am like you start playing with those questions when you allow yourself to be bored you get past that two minute of board period and then your mind starts like going into that other realm of creating and playing so yeah spend a little bit of time on your own and figure out what your quirks are yeah get get off your phone hey eh? get off your phone and sit in silence and doing nothing the thumb scrolls the killer yeah mate what a way to finish uh, yeah. an unbelievable podcast really appreciate you Sweet, coming on mate giving up your weekend um you're you're a true lad and such an incredible journey that you've had um you've been through it all so it's awesome to go through it with you and, well, and be able to share your experiences so i appreciate you giving up your time and coming on mate yeah cheers for having me thanks for putting me on good to connect bro it's been a while you're an absolute lad